Well, you can also use a dry engraving, which uh, is a metal needle. You can actually uh, draw the, the crease lines directly on the copper. I tried. <laughs> I tried uh, copper, aluminium, iron, uh, tin, um, uh, stainless steel, and uh, that's it, I think. And brass, of course. Um, brass is actually copper with zinc, or and then so when I search for a very um, soft. Brass, I thought maybe copper will be better, but it's not. It has the same problems. It has to be the soft cop copper is too soft, the uh, semi soft copper is too hard. So the brass is the only material. And stainless steel, I use, I don't use photo etching, I use laser cutting. Another technique. Okay? So uh, the model that I brought is the cube tessellation, which is the source of many of my metal designs. It's, uh, it's, I came across this model. I, I say, I, I don't know if I invented it. I, I wasn't the first. I think it's true to say that Ron Resch invented it way before me, when I was born, actually. But Ron Resch did everything almost before we, we came to be. But the, the cube tessellation has so many variations and it's very adaptive to so many designs of mine. So this is definitely my favorite model. And this is the, I don't know, maybe the most sellable design that I have. This one. This is a variation of the cube tessellation with curved line b instead of straight lines. Okay. We have uh, more candidates who wants to speak about. Yes, oh, it's you. Yeah, it's only you and me. I told you. Oh, okay. Unless. Well, hi. My name is Arseni. I'm from Belarus, and I'm a tessellator. And I have this white piece of paper that is probably not visible to the people out back. So um, some of you might know that my most uh, common paper I use is paper of quali uh, questionable quality. So because, well, that's the cheapest one and the easiest one to work with. But when I was in Lithuania, I stumbled upon a shop where they sold the so-called marble paper. It's a pretty much regular white paper, 90 uh, grams per square meter. And it has these, um, like, I don't know, gray spots that makes the paper look like a sheet of marble. And the thing with tessellations is that to make the pattern look really well um, articulated, you would need plain paper with no patterns. Because if you use a pattern paper, the pattern you are designing would be hidden. But with marble paper, it turns out that it actually enhances the pattern you're working on. And uh, another thing here is that uh, choosing a right, how would I say, scale for the modal is also a very difficult skill I haven't acquired quite yet. <laughs> because sometimes you, you have something very nice you want to work on, but it's turned out that you, the grid is too small or too big to be, how would I say, nice to look at. So choosing the right format and scaling is very important. So that's all for me. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, somehow this model is called, can you guess what? Now it's called marble because of it's made of marble paper. <laughs> I'm very bad at naming things. But then you can use this paper only for this model, because if you make another model with the same paper, or really call it marble two. I would have to call it something different yeah, than yeah, probably okay. like snow or dirty snow, or probably like, I don't know, something else. More marble, like marbles. Marble two, marble the sequel. 
Ah, interesting. <laughs> okay, I will try doing that. Well, numbering is much easier, like putting like opus number 313. Like that's much better than actually coming up with original names. Actually, regarding the naming, um, oh, the, the toughest work is the final Yes, name. but I found out that it's very interesting, the pieces after I actually designed them, only when I'm uploading them. So lately, like for almost a couple of three, I guess three months, I've been uploading to Instagram, and I started naming uh, my works by, uh, let's call, synesthetic sensations. So I look at it, the first thing that comes to my mind, how it feels like, how it touches like, what, uh, I don't know, taste sensations or uh, hearing sensations, sensations it's cause, it causes inside me, I give it the same name. And actually, pr it's pretty weird, but many people are answering like, oh my, it feels the same way. Can you give an example? Um, there was this last, one of the latest pieces that is gray and it has plenty of um, acute, ed uh, acute elements and it's called Lick a Cold Knife. <laughs> okay. And there were two people who actually said, oh my, it is like this. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> How did they know? They, they, they looked at it. That's well, I well, I believe that some of us tr tried doing that being in the kitchen alone. We're probably being, um, how would I say, unwilling to actually wash the knife instead of just, you can just... <laughs> and do not tell me you did not do this at all. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe anything else? Oh, please. 90 grams per square meter. Very nice, actually. It's better than 80. That's the regular one. It's a bit thicker, so it's very. It's nicer to the touch. And uh, the well, the most important uh, paper quality for me is to be durable. If it is durable, I don't care how it's to the touch, what color it is, because if it's durable, there is no limit to what I can create from it. Because the only limit is that paper at some point starts to act like a rug. And from a rug, just uh, like uh, Adrian said, like leather, it, it, it doesn't cooperate at all. So, uh, yes, pretty much like this. Uh, any more hands? Nope, you're just scratching your... Did you say where we can find it? Um, uh, yes, um, it was found uh, on the second floor of the Acropolis Trade Center in Vilnius, Lithuania. Do you have the name of the uh, manufacturer? Unf of the what? Of the paper? Who made the paper? Nope, I just I didn't remember it. I'm I'm, I'm so sorry. Oh. It's, it's just like a teaser trailer. Just like you got the yes. paper, but you have no idea what it's called. <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. I guess they said Thank who's you. next? Who's next? Oh, we have many. Yes, okay. please come. Okay, tessellators only. Okay, so we the representative guys are kind of shy. <laughs> or maybe... Oh, okay, you just have to fold it first. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Gañan. I, I'm from Madrid, but live in Argentina for 20 years. And this is my first uh, convention with CFC. And I wanted to present you this... Well, this is a normal paper, uh, but uh, it has some kind of... Uh, nice story behind. When I started um, doing my own tessellation, this was my first model. And this model, well, the paper I used for it came from Robin Schultz. <laughs> and uh, it's called the uh, Butterbrot Papier. I think it's, uh, th that's the name in, in, in Germany. And I use it a lot for tessellation when I need uh, transparency. And this is one of the examples of this kind of paper. It's uh, now in origami shop, there is some other paper called um, Alios Craft. Maybe you know it or not. I don't know if you know it. It's similar to this. What's but the name of the, the paper? Uh, Alios. Alios. Alios Craft. Okay. It's similar to this. I, I don't know if it's just the same or not, but uh, what I found is uh, when I use it, it's quite similar to this. Okay. But uh, in this case, well, I use it uh, for this model and for any other mo many other models afterwards. And this for me is a really, really nice uh, paper. 
for this kind of test relations. And another one that uh, I use uh, in the last time is uh, also from, well, I bought it in origami shop, it's uh, called Stark. It's uh, some kind of uh, wood appearance. It has some kind of um, uh, wood inside. And when you fold it and, um, and finish the model, it has some kind of, um, I don't know how to call it in, in English, it's some kind of uh, veins in, in, in the middle of the paper that give it a nice, uh, nice appearance. And also, the uh, transparency is quite good for tessellations, and I use it a lot uh, in some uh, models recently. And that's, uh, that's all for me. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Anyone? Any questions? Any questions? OK. OK. Thank you. Open. Hi. Hi. That sounds strange. Um, I'm Robin. I'm also doing tessellations, and actually, Miguel just introduced my paper. <laughs> um, I was uh, challenged by my friends in Potsdam to fold smaller because they just gave me small paper, and I tried to do um, tessellations with grid instance and, and that go smaller and smaller. So I was looking for thin paper. Um, which is also durable. And what I came across is butterboard papier, which would translate as sandwich paper, but I realized that if I say sandwich paper here, loot paper. No, I mean paper that you use to wrap your sandwiches in. So, and you can buy that in different qualities. You can buy it on a roll of 10 meters length and maybe like around 28 centimeters width. But I found one which is a little bit thicker than usual. And it uh, would translate into English like a parchment substitute. And you can even get it in big sheets like 70, up to 71 times 100 centimeters. There's one drawback. You have to buy at least 12 and a half kilograms <laughs> because it's for the industry, for caterers and so on. Uh, I found one online store in Austria where you can buy one kilogram. You have to pay like, I don't know, 12 euros per shipping, but you still have to pay only 3 euros for the paper. It's a fine deal. I like the paper because it's uh, see-through. Um, I mean, you can, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it's quite translucent. Um, you can fold it with uh, small grid distances and uh, it's still, um, it, the main problem with thin paper is to reverse creases when this is Kind of, re they reverse themselves. You don't have to do much. It's really wonderful for that. Um, and it's interesting to feel because it's quite stiff, but once you fold the grid from it, it gets uh, more like fabric. What's the smallest grid you made? Um, if I want to go really, really small, I have to do a, use another uh, uh, sandwich paper, not this one, which is a bit too thick, but. Um, I, f I still feel quite comfortable if the grid distance is around 1.8 millimeters. That's still okay. I mean, this is around three. Eight. Yeah. Oh, just a bit less than two millimeters. Yeah. Okay. I once I once did 1.5 or something like that, but was was a bit painful because. <laughs> I always make small mistakes, and if you make a mistake of which is a, of uh, like 0.3 millimeters, it's not so wor so bad usually. Yes. But if your good distance is only 1.5 millimeters, and your mistake is 0.3 millimeters, that's already that's quite huge and distorts your pattern. But um, then uh, the smaller you get, you the longer it takes you to fold, which is also not so good. <laughs> yeah, Hans. Um, I feel it's very similar to baking paper. Uh, I think baking paper is maybe a little bit more slippery. And um, in baking paper, you usually the grid lines are more visible. Uh, from my experience, if you use baking paper, you have strong lines. And in this, you don't see the lines as much. But uh, from the folding point of view, it's quite similar.
here. Here I have like uh, three pieces of, oh, what's that, 50 times 70. You can get one or two sheets. <laughs> yeah, there is actually, uh, there is uh, one woman uh, from Germany who bought this big pack and uh, to every convention she brings a, a stack to, uh, to pass around. So if you come to the German convention you might have a chance to get some. Also the German convention is quite cool anyway, so. <coughs> I think. I'm a bit biased, but yeah. More questions? No? More paper to introduce? Okay, so who's next? Hans, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Hans Dybkjær from Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, a few years ago I wrote a paper for the fold called Folding Apples and Oranges, which is about making a sphere from paper. And apart from the geometrical problem of how to approximate a, a sphere from the flat paper, um, um, I tried to do this in a number of different kinds of paper, like elephant hide or uh, copy paper or other kinds of paper. And um, it turns out that it is not easy to make a nice sphere. I ended up making an orange like this one here. Um, it so is this is a single sheet of paper? This is a single sheet of paper. Okay. Um, which was the challenge to, to make. Um, and it is a 10-sided polygon. Um, I also tr made them from 8-sided polygons because they are easier to, to, to construct than the 10-sided ones. Um, but for this one, I ended up using a tissue foil where I glued orange tissue onto Alu foil. Um, I usually don't use tissue foil much because um, you talked about before that brass is not forgiving, and in principle, uh, tissue foil is forgiving because you can reverse it, but you end up with crumpled models rather than something that looks nice. Um, but um, for this one, when you fold it, uh, you have seen a lot of pairs and spheres made uh, by Jun Mitani and other people who, where you have all the flaps on the earth outside. But I wanted the flaps on the inside. Um, so when you come to try to close that in the top, in the end, um, it is very difficult to close it up cleanly. But it turned out that the thin, um, thin paper you get from tissue foil and the property that if you put it into a position, it stays there, um, was what I needed to make a very fine ending here, even if I needed to lock the paper from the inside, which um, was what is what poses the problems in folding this one. So do you use some kind of tools? Yes, of course. Um, uh, my finger is too, <laughs> too, too big. Um, in our kitchen, we have something we in Danish call them meat needles. Okay. Uh, you use them, well, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't use them for that, but you would use them to uh, stick, for instance, bacon to other kinds of meat, or if you make a roll from meat, you will use them to okay. uh, make, st let them stay. So I took one of these, and I bent the end, the thin end, so that 
it would have a hook. Okay. And then I could put that hook in the inside and knowing where the paper ought to be, I could then fold it into position to, to close it up uh, in the end. So, and also one, one more thing that if you think about it, uh, oranges are often a bit shiny. Um, and um, the adufoil actually shines through yeah. the uh, tissue paper yeah. here. Uh, it is a small elephant. <laughs> that is why it is a bit clumsy in small how elephant it moves. height. Yeah. He's an elephant. Yeah, he <laughs> okay, any more questions? Nobody wonders how he managed to do it so cleanly. Yeah, exactly. Um, when you come closer to um <laughs> <laughs> the other end <laughs> um this is the center of the paper and this down here is the rim of the paper and of course when you come closer to that point um the flaps that are there become wider and wider and um you might not be able to see it from up there, but if you come down here and look, you will see that the lines here are piecewise linear. I try to hide it, but they are in the end they're linear. So um, the flaps will have, um, I need somebody to hold this. <laughs> um, you have the paper from the flap and you, they must do like this. Overlap. Overlap. You, so you, f you make a crimp fold. Oh, the other was the word. The crimp fold. <laughs> um, to, to crimp it. But when you are up there, you in have a huge flap. And the standard way to lock something that is folded like this is to take the corner and fold down along the uh, the ridge, the, the folded uh, outer ridge here. So this is just what I did. I took that and folded it down behind itself. And okay. it is, so that's how the lock was done. Okay, it is. Yeah. A tiny what? Yes, yes, yes. It, it it goes around like that. You you if you have ever tried to do the um, Fujimoto box, it is the same kind of uh, yeah. loop you would have if you looked could look at it from from there. Like the here. Yes, yes, exactly. If if not uh, for the the fact that it forgot to bring a pocket light, <laughs> so yeah. Okay, who else wants to share? Yes, James. Okay, so it crumbles. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name's James. Uh, I live in St. Louis. It's square in the center of the United States, um, about five hours drive from Chicago. Um, so uh, I guess this is basically a teaser to my talk on Sunday. Um, and I guess I want to preface that with a conversation that several of us had with Elon um, for dinner last night. And we we're talking about collections. 
And I guess this paper is relevant in that it's really hard to find, and people are more likely to collect it rather than use it, at least at this stage. But we're working to get more. Um, so this paper is called Hao Pao. And Hao Pao is made in one village by three people in northern Vietnam. Um, and that ties to my thesis. I'm a graduate student, and so I'm really interested, because of origami, um, in the motivations uh, about why people use certain plants for making paper. And part of it is accessibility. You know, you work with the species that are present in your area, and those plants are made of cellulose, so in principle, you could use any plant you wanted. But there are certain reasons why you use uh, specific plants, and this is a plant called Hao Pao that this particular ethnic group uses to write their ancestral records. And so they have this beautiful calligraphy and Chinese characters using this paper. And I saw that, and it made this really nice rustle sound, and I was like, oh, we gotta fold with that. So the thing is, um, because they use it for ancestral records, they don't make it very often because uh, people are not constantly dying. Um, and they make it only in the winter. Uh, so winter is starting to pass, and we might be able to get some sheets from him uh, very soon. So this paper is, is made from a species uh, called Linaspa per simile. It's related to your Lokta, your Zaw paper, your Mitsumata, and your Gampi. And uh, just by feeling, I haven't done any measurements with it. It's maybe 30 or 40 grams per square meter. Um, it's extremely crisp. Um, and you can get it in sheets about, they're one by two in dimensions, um, maybe, I don't know, a meter long by half a meter wide. Um, and uh, through my research and contacts in Vietnam, we we're working to actually place an order and have that available on the market so many more people can try and work with it. Um, if any of you know uh, Ryan Charpentier, he's folded a, an excellent rendition of Shiki Kato's uh, Bactrian Camel from it. Um, but because I was only able to bring about 20 sheets back with me, only a few people have access to it. So I just want to preface that. I'm working to get more, and I hope to share it with the origami community, because paper making has been so foundational in making origami what it is. Maybe there's a way we can help support the people who make the paper that we use. Thank you. So uh, I work with a collaborative called the Zaw Project in Hanoi, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. Um, because of things like war with the United States and war with the, Fr uh, with the French uh, over many decades, um, a lot of the ethnography has not been done in parts of uh, the former Indochina, and so we really don't know a lot of the traditions that they've done for so long. This dates back centuries. And so now that there's a lot of peace and, you know, um, their traditions are now available uh, through the, the free market. You know, there might be a way for them to, to uh, maintain their tradition even as things like mechanical industrial paper making threatens to take that away. So I'm hoping to document more of, of what their local knowledge is and make it available for us to not only use but use to help support them so they can continue what they do. Uh, yeah, so they don't use any sizing. Um, they use, in hand paper making, they use uh, uh, like a mucilaginous liquid. Uh, in Japan, it's called Tororo Aoi. Um, but they use a different species related to laurel. And they mix it in with a fiber and pour it on the screen. But it's not actually sizing. And what's great about it is, I didn't size this either, either but it has this nice rustle to it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to talk about it in your talk? Yeah. Ah, okay. So come see so it. So no more question. If you want, <laughs> come to his talk. Okay. Thank you. Hello. My name is Fernando Sanchevizma. I'm from Madrid. And 
Here I have the paper. <laughs> this is my favorite paper right now. Um, this is silk paper. I bought it just three, I discovered it three weeks ago. Uh, it was uh, said by Victor over there. And this silk paper is from a manufacturing company in Madrid. And they sell it, well, they don't sell it. They sell it in uh, huge amounts. Uh -huh. The minimum uh, is 500 seats, which is a lot. Right. And I remember three weeks ago, I went there to the, to the factory. And I went there, I want to buy some paper for doing origami. And they look at me like as if I was uh, a freaky, <laughs> some kind of strange pe uh, person. And when I said I wanted just 50 or 60 seats, they said, okay, just take this, don't pay anything because it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this beautiful paper. It's very thin. It's uh, uh, very strong. You can fold it once and again, and it doesn't break. And you can squeeze it very, very tight, so you can do all these kind of models with a lot of flaps, very thin, and uh, and you can put water on it, just a little bit of water on, uh, just to help you squeeze the paper. And when it dries, it gets uh, relatively uh, strong. Um, I'm using it, uh, I had not folded uh, this kind of models in four years. I only, <laughs> I folded them for the last Olympic Games. And now this year we have again Olympic Games, so I, I have begun to fold this kind of models, okay? And uh, the process is uh, uh, I just take the paper, square paper. This is a square paper of 86 centimeters per 86 centimeters. I fold the, the base, which is a very painful process. As you can imagine, there are a lot of fla uh, flaps with different sizes, with different, uh, uh, there are something like six middle flaps so you can imagine how difficult it is to work with this big paper and fold the base. So do you Once actually make the folds or do you yeah, company? Yeah. No, no, I, I first, uh, you have to be very precise okay. to, to fold this model because the, the, the length of the flaps is essential. Okay. I have folded this twice and the first time I, I wasn't very precise and I ended up with a bicycle, big bicycle, with a small man. It was like a child on a bicycle, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so next time I said, okay, I have to be more precise. And so I folded the complete base. And was, uh, once I had the base, you have to decide if you want to uh, use the traditional origami. And so every flap you inside reverse it something like eight or 10 times, you end up with, uh, very long flaps, and then you do the model, or you can choose, which is my, my choice, you can choose to crumple the paper, okay? <laughs> which I think, uh, for me, the result is much better this okay. way than the other way, and much less painful, okay? And uh, I end the, the model, instead of using just water, what I use is water with a little bit of white glue. No, it's kind of MC, okay, it's the same, Thing, but I, the end result is, uh, I think, stronger. Okay. Um, that's so it. what's the proportion between the water and the glue? Uh, just a little bit. Uh, I don't know the, the proportion, but I don't know. Uh, something like one to one fifth, oh. something like that. One fifth of water or one fifth one of glue? One fifth of glu uh, white glue. Okay. Okay. More questions? Yes. <laughs> he's um, he's um, Miguel um, Indurain. Um, um, well, yes. <laughs> who is that person again on the bicycle? Miguel Indurain, you know uh -huh. the famous uh, Spanish cyclist. Who well, obviously, obviously Spanish. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we have one more minute. Do we have any more candidates? Yes. Matthew? But you have to be brief, uh, uh, although nobody's coming. 
Now, we are supposed to go to Emos now. I don't know if the buses are outside or not, but uh, I guess Jorge will come and call us. Yes, okay, so ahead. this is really quick. Um, this is an interesting case. I, I can't tell exactly what kind of paper it is, but I, I learned a lesson from this paper besides it working out really well. So this, this model is a nun. Um, it, it's folded from a one by two rectangle. Uh, it's wet folded, obviously. Um, and just the, it was interesting because for an exhibit we had done a while back, some friends and I, we, uh, one of my friends who's more adventurous with paper than I am, uh, folded a whole bunch of penguins. And uh, he had some paper left over. So after the exhibit was done, he said, I'm not going to make any more penguins. I, anyone want the paper? And I said, well, I'll take it. You know, And I had no idea what I was going to do with it, but uh, it's, it's thicker than I usually use. But I said, well, I have the paper. What can I do? So I decided to fold the nun, and I found that paper in my drawer, and, and uh, it worked out really well. So I think the, the lesson I learned uh, is to be more adventurous with paper than I have perhaps been in the past, and never to throw away scraps, oh. right? Because you know, a, a one person's scrap turns out to be someone else's treasure that works perfectly for a model they needed paper for. So Who will throw paper? Yes, I don't no. think anyone actually throws no, it. We never <laughs> throw paper. So, anyway, that's the story. But you cannot say what type of paper it is. I don't know because he bought the paper in. Oh, he he. Uh, there are two different kinds of paper that he glued together with methyl oh, cellulose, okay. and I know they're different. They're different kinds of paper, so it's not like biotope. It's one is something and the other is something yeah, else. Okay, so we look and for something and something. And look oh, something okay. and something else exactly. <laughs> well, I can tell you that the white paper is very fibrous, and you have to be careful because it comes apart with water. So I use it to fold the black and white cat that's in my exhibit as well, also a scrap from the same batch. And uh, if you fold it too much, it's just the white just starts come, to come apart in your hands. Now, I figured it was okay for the cat because it looks furry, and cats are furry, so not a big deal. Um, but it's perfect for a model like this. That's, uh, it's box pleated, not very complicated, and so I didn't have that problem of it coming apart because I wasn't folding it that much. It was just fairly straightforward and wet folding and modeling, and it didn't come apart. So. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, so let's conclude this wonderful session. Uh, thanks to everyone who brought the model and talked about the paper. I think uh, James' talk is going to be fully packed. I was sure you are going to say meet none somewhere in your... <laughs> but you didn't. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Okay, from, now, from here we go to Emos. We are going to have two buses. I don't have uh, all the details. Uh, I thought that Jorge will come and explain how it goes, but uh, they will leave from the outside. Um, and after that, we have dinner and we have uh, El, pa Pia Palta? El Plata, which is a cabaret, I understand. So if you're into this, uh, just go there. Um, if you didn't get a package, a complimentary package from Origami Shop of papers, you can come to me and I'll give you one. And uh, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs>